Well, hi, gang. Thanks for joining us. Paul M. Newberger, the founder of C Suite for Christ. And boy, howdy, it's a really exciting day. It's the day of the Covering the World in Christ celebration, where we talk about the Great Commission and really kind of inspire other people to live a life boldly and unapologetically for Jesus Christ. And our guest today is somebody who has spent a large chunk of his life doing just that. I'm joined here by Matt Marr. And uh, Matt, thank you for uh, being with us here today. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm curious about is I was talking about our, our theme today is really all about the Great Commission, boldly, unapologetically living a life where we're bringing others to Christ. In your opinion, are enough Christians boldly and unapologetically living their faith today? Great question. I, I figured I'd give you the easy one first. Yeah, thanks. Just, yeah, You're welcome. Toss me a softball. <laughs> I feel like the only way I, I can answer that question is to just simply say that every day, I, at some point, hopefully in my day, I'm asking myself that question. You know, there's that old poem, one man wakes, awakens another, next one wakes his next door brother, third one wakes, rouse a town, turn the whole world upside down, many awake and cause such a fuss, finally wakes all the rest of us. One man wakes with the dawn in his eyes, surely then it multiplies. It's an old poem about the Great Awakening. So I think every day I wake up and sort of ask God, yeah, help me, make me available for you in whatever way. I think it's a great question for everyone to constantly ask, to be able to go before the Lord and say, like, am I you know, with my life laid bare before you, all my relationships, the circumstances I find myself, the situations, am I truly being available to be a witness? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's usually not directly talking about God. It's more so like being his ambassador. And then, and then people are like, well, why? I want what you're having. <laughs> and, and I think it's, being prepared in those moments to be able to say, to be able to share about the love of Jesus and the incredible difference it makes in our lives when we surrender, we receive His forgiveness, and we walk dependent on mercy and grace, and we kind of show that dependence in the way that we live. And when you talk about living your life boldly for Christ, it's Man, if I express boldness for anything, may it be my dependence, my need for God. Because more than ever, it could be that what people need to be reminded of is what it looks like to need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's that witness and sort of that willingness of being vulnerable that probably gives other people permission to do the same thing. Sure. Yeah, and I, I'm sure this is going to be a loaded question because no. you've obviously had a lot of things that have taken place in your life. Not everybody has the same stage that you do. You're obviously a gifted musician. You're really using your talents to, to bring glory and honor to God. Have you always been this bold? What, 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 was there like an instance in your life that you can point to that maybe made you from a closet Christian to, hey, you know what, I'm going to surrender my talents and I'm going to give it all to Christ? Well, I think I had a moment where I realize how loved I was by God and how inadequate I was of that. My parents had gotten divorced in my 20s and I, I hadn't, I kind of quit going to church when I was in high school. I had just, yeah, I think encountered a lot uh, pretty hard times, made some pretty terrible decisions, you know, partied a lot in college. I think when I encountered the love of God playing music on a youth retreat, where I was supposed to be up there like leading worship and I'm crying in between every song because I can't describe what's happening other than I'm, I'm encountering sort of like the manifest love and presence of God. What I would say is music's the thing that I was good at. You know, I kind of grew up in a generation where it's like you do the thing you're good at mm -hmm. and uh, I was not good with numbers so this is just why I'm not an accountant but I loved music and when I I think my whole life, whenever I've played music, I've felt the nearness of God. Like looking back, I would say, oh man, I was just hard, this is just how I was hardwired. Like God sort of hardwired me this way that like when I sing or when I play, 
so it was funny, singing didn't really happen until I started uh, serving at church on a weekly basis. And I really kind of cut my teeth playing at services on weekends and weddings and funerals and baptisms and youth retreats. And I think it's that 10,000 hours of mastery, you know, where you're just sort of like kind of putting in hidden, unseen, laborious work. It's an interesting question you ask about platform because I think a lot of us sometimes forget the fact that most of the people in the Bible at any given point, like especially the people who followed Jesus, their influence, it wasn't massive. I mean, Jesus himself, he, he fed 5,000 people. That was kind of like the biggest event he ever did, event. Mm -hmm. Except, you know, we know that the cross is actually the single greatest. Of, it's the center of all human history. And, but when you look at the, all the other followers, you look at Matthew, you look at, um, you look at Stephen, it's the first martyr. You, you could arguably look at their, their lives and you could say, how many people did they really influence when they were living? But the testimony of their life continues to live on and they lived their life, however small and insignificant in the moment in such a way that now we're still talking about it. And I think that that's the thing about the history of the church that's so great and reminds people that the kingdom of God is upside down. What I would say to anybody, if someone says, well, I don't have the kind of platform that you do. And I'm like, well, great. Um, because I have no control over how God uses my music to help people. That's not even necessarily why I do it. I can't control the outcome of my music much more than I'm not sure that any of us can, out, can, can control the outcome of the things that we do. We can't, we can't control how significant something becomes. All we can do is do something because it's the right thing to do and it's true and it's, it, it's the thing that's defined our life and if we don't do it, we'll be cheating ourselves. If I don't make my music in a way that glorifies God, if I don't show up for my family as a, a loving husband and a good dad, like I'm not doing the thing that I know that God wants me to do. I have no idea how it will ripple. I, I can't control that. But that's not why I should be doing it in the first place. I should just be doing it because God loves it when I, when I show up to those things. And so like I would say to anybody who has if you have relationships, if you're loved, if you're, if you have a family, if you're, if you have a, if you have a job and you work with people, like you have an opportunity and an obligation because you've been saved <laughs> to just show up and love those people around you. Not because of the outcome it's, it's gonna, like you can't control. My wife's grandfather just passed away. He was 93 years old, hmm. six kids, 13 grandkids, 31 great-grandchildren. Wow. Served in the Air Force, uh, drove a truck, loved God, gave me his brother's accordion when I joined the family. His funeral was one of the most moving things I'd ever been to. And he wasn't, he had no idea when he, when he made all the decisions he made in life and showed up for his wife and was a loving husband for 70 years, like the, the outcome of being at that funeral with all these people praying and crying and laughing and celebrating his life, he had no idea that that would happen. I guess that's my point. No, it makes a lot of sense. And, and you're right. The, the interactions that we have every day, the, the emails that we send, the social media posts that we make, a lot of times we just, we don't know who's going to see no that. We have no idea who we're interacting with. You know, it's like, right. it's like we're entertaining angels, but we're also entertaining saints. Like we don't know how our interaction with someone else, it could be, God could be in there using this moment to just completely alter the trajectory of another person's life. Yeah, it's pretty humbling when you think about that. Oh, it's, it, it's huge. One of the things you started with too that I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on, you, you had talked about when you were you know, leading worship and yeah. you're, you're doing the piano or the guitar, whatever you're doing, and, and you're feeling the love of God. What would you say to somebody who listens to you say that and say, well, Matt, you're lucky you've had an experience like that. Or, or Matt, you're lucky you, yeah. you feel the love of God. I'm in my life, I, I don't feel God's presence. I don't feel God's love. Maybe he loves Matt Marr, maybe he doesn't love me. I, I, I do think there are some people that are maybe going through a season 
where they feel that God is distant or that God is not walking side by side. If somebody says, I, I wish I felt God's love like you do, what would you say to that person? I think now the first thing that I would say is, that's okay. For, I think the first thing is just saying it's okay. That that's actually biblically and historically as much of a spiritual disposition as levitating in the presence of God. The Psalms are full of human expressions of doubt and angst and frustration and confusion. And a lot of times, half of what we're experiencing is our own shame or guilt because we expect that we should be feeling or expecting something else. Mm. And so I think the first thing I would say to somebody is just to say, I see you and I've been there too and it's okay. But can you agree with me that there is the possibility that it will change? Mm. And, it's, and can you believe in the possibility with a sense of expectancy that it can change. Mm. I know it's night, but do you think at around 4.30, 5 o'clock, the sky's gonna get a little bit lighter? Is there enough evidence of your life to say that we operate in this world of cyclical seasons and times? And the Bible speaks clearly about how sorrow can last for a night, which is a while, but joy does come in the morning. And so if you can believe that the morning will come, then you can also believe and hope that the joy will come with it. And that's what hope is. Mm -hmm. Hope isn't the absence of, of doubt and frustration and sorrow. It's the belief that it will change in the midst of it. Well, I gotta tell you, gang, this has been one of my favorite things of, of running the C-Suite for Christ ministry is I, I've always listened to, to K-Love and The Message and some of those other Christian songs, but, but until I actually started to get close to some of these musicians, the depth of these individuals, the, 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 the passion, the, the true love of Jesus Christ that you have is really inspiring. So thank you. Uh, it's been a blessing to sit with, uh, with Matt Marr, obviously looking forward to what he's gonna do here tonight. If you're interested in joining our movement of covering the world in Christ by boldly and unapologetically declaring to the world whose you are, check out our website, csweetforchrist.com and join us in this movement.